When you want it right and you want it quick, try the one for all. You be okay, you big. Can't make the fruit contest, Helen. Stomach's upset. I'll fix you, Ubik. Ubik drops you back in the thick of things fast. Taken as directed, Ubik speeds relief to head and stomach. Remember, Ubik is only seconds away. You be okay, you big. Avoid prolonged use. Relax and unwind while Arc to Microchip times in with the counterclock worlds of Philip K. Dick. <laughs> this little story, Rube, is about an actual dog whose name was Snooper. Snooper believed as much in his work as I did in my writing. <laughs> Apparently, his work was to see that no one stole the food from his owner's garbage can. Snooper was laboring under the delusion that his owners considered the garbage valuable. Every day they'd carry out paper sacks of delicious food and carefully deposit them in a strong metal container, placing the lid down firmly. At the end of the week, the garbage can was full, whereupon the worst assortment of evil entities in the Sol system drove up in a huge truck and stole the food. So about 5 a.m. every Friday, Snooper would emit his first bark. My wife and I figured that was about the time the garbage men's alarm clocks were going off. Snooper knew when they left their houses. He could hear them. Snooper must have thought he inhabited a planet of lunatics. I asked myself, what must the world look like to that dog? Obviously, he doesn't see as we see. He has developed a complete system of beliefs, a worldview totally different from ours, but logical, given the evidence he is basing it on. These are the words of Philip Kindred Dick, creator of Blade Runner, author of Cosmic Puppets, The Man Who Japed, Dr. Futurity, Time Out of Joint, The Man Whose Teeth Were All Exactly Alike, and countless other psych stories, skiz novels, and bug-eyed scenarios. While maintaining the posture of a writer of science fantasy for a special group of readers who cherish that genre, always behind the plot smokescreen of extraterrestrials, future societies, machine paradigms, counterclock worlds, and Lewis Carrollian wubs from Mars, is the full-blown religio-mystic Dickian outlook, a theory of reality as we experience it outside fiction, in day-to-day -day encounters that posit a just-around-the-corner arcana of hyperdimensions lying in wait, phantasmal migrations into the no longer future and the unbecoming past. Something you may call strictly retrograde, right? Not exactly. And Philip K. Dick is always happy to explain how not exactly that is. In fact, Dick inhabits a menagerie of unrealizable prototype worlds. Half-born anti-conceptions, dim sources of wonder, or brightly lit techno-cul-de-sacs. Little wonder as some of his most devoted fans seem at times to be forever wandering there. Operating like a traveling, one-man discontinuity of the space-time matrix, Philip mints cosmos after cosmos with the sense of inspired bluff that keeps even his best friends and sci-fi colleagues unsure where method merges with incipient madness. Blessed with almost photographic recall, a mind obsessed with theories, game strategies, and conspiratorial inferences, Dick seemed different even before he taught himself to type at age 12 and began his self-chosen career based on his fascination with magazines like Stirring Stories, Unknown Worlds, Astounding Science Fiction, and Amazing Stories. By the time Phil sold one of his stories to one of his beloved sci-fi pulps in 1951, he had dropped out of Berkeley, married, divorced, and remarried, been rejected from the draft, and kicked out of his job at Art Music Records. One, two, three. The Berkeley Bohemian. Ensconced in his new garret-like, slanted-ceiling apartment at Dwight Way, Dick and his newlywed Cleo savored the vicissitudes of simple meals, primary colors, hi-fi sides of Mahler and Turk Murphy, leafing through the divine comedy, and tongue-twisting fragments of Heraclitus, immersing themselves in the casual bohemia of the Berkeley intelligentsia circa 51. 
The peculiar antics of a neighbor dog soon intrigued unemployed Phil, and he began spinning a Kano-centric fantasy about the whys and wherefores of the dog's behavior. This crisply honed garbage can tail entitled Rug was to be the protoform for much of Phil's 27 years of professional writing. You start from a sentient entity and work outward, inferring its world, and each creature lives in a world somewhat askew from all other creatures. You can't ever really know what its world is like, but you can make some pretty good guesses. When Anthony Boucher at Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine finally purchased Rug for publication, it became for Dick the final link in his initiation into sci-fi pulp prominence, with a flood of futuristic story sales arriving in its wake. In 1953 alone, 30 stories were published, including seven in one month. From then on, Phil's fingers danced Shiva across his cast iron royal. Enter the man in THC. Hearing a cuckoo cry, I looked up in the direction whence the sound came. What did I see? Only the pale moon in the dawning sky. This provocative Japanese poem on the back of a pack of heavenly music, herbal cigarettes, is just one fascinating detail that brings home the victorious Nipponese omnipresence in Dick's Hugo-honored alternative current era California a society depicted with utterly convincing reality in The Man in the High Castle, or as Dick referred to it, The Man in THC. The Axis powers have won the war, and the United States is an occupied territory divided between the large eastern sector, controlled by Nazis, and the western seaboard, administered by the more humane Japanese. The non-aligned Rocky Mountain states, a curious society, neither fish nor fowl, maintains a precarious existence, and here dwells the man in the high castle, sci-fi author Hawthorne Abinson. His novel, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, with the title taken from Ecclesiastes, is an explosive underground bestseller that both repels and fascinates the powers that be and the public at large in Dick's book within the book alternative to the alternative scenario. Despite its outlawed status, the grasshopper is ubiquitous, talked about by everyone and making its author the target of totalitarian retribution. Why all the fuss? Because Grasshopper imagines a world where the Allies have won. There was no Pearl Harbor, and in some insane topsy-turvy fashion, the Japanese were prevented from taking the Philippines and occupying Australia. Kingian Chaostrophes One indispensable aspect of the world inhabited by the man in THC's characters is their relentless consultation of the E King, a lifestyle oracle compiled by Chinese pre-Han Taoist sages and still used by angst-ridden sophistites looking for a window of clarity amid flat time duration scams and clock-fed industrial maniacal mind traps. The E King proposes that time is experienced as a series of identifiable elements in flux. Heraclitus taught that reality is a constantly changing flame-like holodeck burst of chaotically coalescing universes, or chaostrophes, a notion that sprang simultaneously with Zeitgeistian urgency from the pineal gland sensitivities of time-slipping Taoist turtle shell consultants and their cultural counterparts halfway around the globe, the ancient Greeks. In China, these insights into the numberless changes of the 10,000 things took the form of a remarkable oracular document, the Yi King or the Book of Changes, an easily recognizable set of temporal resonance maps that offers practical and profitable common sense methodologies for coping with the chaos dynamics of what you know, who you know, and where you're heading. What began as a ritual turtle roast to read the synchronous cracks appearing or not appearing in the shell's hexagram segments soon became a yarrow stick toss fest for those seeking solace in the construction of ideogrammatic and dispensable Zen-to-go info packets that always seem to provide down-home advice in even the stickiest situations. These are the 64 hexagrams that entered the lives of 20th century Americans. 
It first happened in 1950, like a candle in the wind, when the avant-garde music of John Cage rose to stateside E. King immortality by introducing the Garden of Forking Paths concept into the mainstream media maze we were collectively beginning to navigate. The King came overground again in 1962, when a fully fleshed out alternative reality scheme was just on the verge of high impact widespread assimilation. Pioneer, pataphysician, and metaphysicist Philip K. was right there on the cusp, coaxing the coy oracle over the boundary between efficiency mad, time equals dollars mentalities reigning heretofore, and the nouveau E. King positive after Kennedy wake up schemes that eventually led to Hendrix at Woodstock and to the new Mandelbrot mindset just beginning to prick the pretensions of hard science with thorny fractal practicalities. The paradoxes uncovered by the shape-shifting 1960s were soon being encountered in every logo-based attempt to chart and comprehend human activity, from Olympic swimming and utopian architecture to the choice of peaches or pears at the local safety mart. A study of authenticity. Hawthorne Abinson, the reclusive near-mythic sci-fi writer in Dick's High Castle novel, has carried his society's mania for the E. King from the casual to the critical. Through thousands of tosses, the plot of his novel, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, is formulated for him by the Oracle. Historic period, subject, characters, plot. Unlike the world Abinson inhabits, his grasshopper fiction reveals strange twists and tears in the historic fabric. Roosevelt has not been assassinated, but dies before World War II begins. In the USA, the racial problem has been solved by 1950 without bloodshed. But the big shocker is, the US and the UK defeat the Nazis and the rest of the Axis. In author Abinson's reality as he perceives it outside his novel, even a fictional account of the fascist conquerors losing the war is political heresy. That in an America divided between dictators of the East and the West, ordinary readers of the Grasshopper book wonder if things might not have been better if the Allies had won. One of Abinson's biggest fans is the darkly beautiful Juliana Frank, who, in seeking further enlightenment concerning the secret of Grasshopper's creation, cast the E King only to discover that the Chinese yellow stocks are telling her that Abinson's tale is actually the truth, and her world, as friends and lovers experience it, is a total scam. It is here that the man in the high castle becomes a study of authenticity at the very fabric level of existence. Is the world that Dick's characters inhabit an evil, fake creation like the pandemonium of Milton's Paradise Lost, built by fallen angels as a Disney-esque attempt at the city of heaven? Is our world such a world, Phil asks us? Does a constant bombardment of pseudo-information, fake news, and altered video make us ultimately unable to confirm the historical or personal truth behind anything? For example, Phil tells the story of the fake birds at Disneyland in another one of his autobiographical fragments. The birds are worked by electric motors which emit caws and shrieks as you pass them. Suppose some night all of us sneaked into the park with real birds and substituted them for the artificial ones. The Disney people couldn't handle it. Real hippos and lions would be worse. The amusement complex would close down in total confusion. Phil worries about our own post-Nixonian Tomorrowland in the same way. The visage of perfect evil. Back in his youth, Phil's dad Edgar told toddler Phil panic-stricken tales of World War I gas attacks, of soldiers gone mad tearing off their gas masks and running. His father would put on his army helmet and gas mask as he told these stories. To baby Phil, these were occasions when his father's face would seem to disappear. This was not Phil's father any longer. Behind the mask, 
this was not a human being at all. In the second half of 1963, Phil and then-wife Anne's relationship had reached a crisis. They had joined the Episcopalian Church in Inverness. A few months before the first Kennedy assassination, Phil had a horrific religious vision amid the clouds above Bongo Gnostic Bohemian Berkeley. One day, while walking down the country road to my shack, looking forward to eight hours of writing in total isolation from all other humans, I looked up in the sky and saw a face. I didn't really see it, but the face was there, and it was not a human face. It was a vast visage of perfect evil. I realize now, and I think I dimly realized at the time, what caused me to see it. The months of isolation, of deprivation of human contact, in fact, sensory deprivation as such. But anyhow, the visage could not be denied. It was immense. It filled a quarter of the sky. It had empty slots for eyes. It was metal and cruel. And worst of all, it was God. I drove over to my church and talked to my priest. He came to the conclusion that I had had a glimpse of Satan and gave me unction, not supreme unction, just healing unction. It didn't do any good. The metal face in the sky remained. I had to walk along every day as it gazed down at me. The final draft of the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, placed in a manila envelope and posted to the Meredith Agency in March 1964, is actually only one narrow swatch of a tremendous chunk of primo pulp sci-fi fuel for the flame manuscript copy the typing fool Phil gathered together in the brief, frantic, amphetamine-filled 12-month period surrounding the Oswaldian Dallas apocalypse. Next stop, Mars. As the LBJ epoch took shape stateside, one young and upcoming UK teddy boy, John Lennon, was discovering that living was easy with eyes closed in the pages of the Three Stigmata. Lennon was convinced that a film treatment with himself as the wild and dazzling Phil Dickey and solo pro Palmer, accomplishing miracles getting auto fact production on colony planets while he piles up consumer goods in unlikely solar neighborhoods, would change everyone's attitudes, including those of Lennon himself, expanding them beyond the theater seats out into the slumbering streets and soon to the numberless stars beyond, where it counted even more. Palmer Eldritch anticipated things that his world could not yet envision, the prognostic gift conferred by imbibing an alien lichen. The Tomorrowland, depicted in Dick's stigmata, is a bogged-down dystopia, making do with truffle-skin currency, hassling with argumentative autocabs, and tinkering neurotically with something perfectly described by its title, evolution therapy a procedure that creates sensational advancement or dismal reversal. Desperate for the liberation only the doomed Eldritch can provide, Earth's future citizens place all their social hopes on a fleeting utopian union of souls inside tiny Barbie and Ken style stage sets brought to life with the hallucinatory assistance of Can D, a UN sanctioned mind melting substance licensed for off-world use by super bored ore miners whiling away weary hours beneath the desolate surface of furthermost Mars. When you want it right and you want it quick try the one for all you be okay you be Taken as directed Ubik provides uninterrupted sleep without morning after grogginess you awaken fresh, ready to tackle all those little annoying problems. You be okay, you be. Do not exceed recommended dosage. Kippled Out, LA 2019. 
by the time dick fan Tim Leary actually got around to giving Phil a phone call in the spring of 69, it was already too late. Phil's fascination with the good doctor's elixirs was on the wane. He was way beyond that now, he told Leary. To be specific, January the 3rd, 2021, and entropic forces wreaking havoc in his personal life, like suspected FBI surveillance, IRS audits, and the rampant overconsumption of stimulants were combining and combating on every plane of Phil's existence. Between the phone and the mail slot, troublesome heaps of angry messages and threatening correspondence were mounting as the centrifugal force of Phil's paranoia picked him up and paper wadded him into a startling techno-thrashed vision of the new century. Page after page of replicant toads, electric sheep, Bizarre futuristic pet hospitals, fugitive androids fleeing the desolate Martian outer colonies, and an endless proliferation of kipple. A Fildickian term for accumulating junk that exemplifies the breakdown of history into final disorder, all became vividly characterized in Phil's favorite type between the well-worn ribbon and the hard rubber roller of his responsive manual royal. This was Phil's first hard copy response to a question his own lifestyle seemed to insist on asking him. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Certainly not the only question that was keeping author Dick tossing and turning. There was the question of android sex. The verdict. It's convincing, if you don't think about it too much. To Phil's real-life wife, Nancy, he seemed almost like another person as he carried on conversations with his brain children in the midst of urgent matters on the domestic plane. But Phil knew something neither she nor anyone else around him knew. By 1973, Hollywood would love it. As it happened, United Artists did pick up Sheep's option at that time. But, something no one predicted, it took almost a decade to get the film out. By then it was called Blade Runner. The plot had been almost streamlined out of existence, and Phil was in his final brilliant decline, polishing other, more mature, futuristic fables, perhaps to be used after the first 20-odd years of his concepts had leaped over ground, like Electric Sheep finally did. Despite its limitations, Blade Runner has been described with the M word, and masterful on the mood and image front it undoubtedly is. Twenty-first century purgatory. On screen, belching zigs of toxic smoke and flaming phosphor torch zags of industrial waste overshroud a Dantean Silicon Valley vision, obscuring, then revealing in detail the corporate lifestyle monoliths looming fortress-like over a totally divided city. This is Blade Runner's convincing, ominous depiction of Los Angeles 2019. Already awakened by the automatic mood organ beside his bed, android hunter extraordinaire Rick Deckard has cast off his multicolored pajamas and is in the active mode amid the sunless orientalized streets of the post-urban techno slum that L.A. has become. The cast is all star, with Harrison Ford doing his latter-day Bogart best to guide us as Virgilian host through his 21st century purgatory, where genetically empowered corporate sharks manipulate DNA to crank out generations of Orwellian replicant worker drones, each hyper-aware and hyper-acute and yet doomed to a pre-programmed fate. Rutger Hauer as Roy Batty, the cyber-assed rude boy ringleader, gives an Aryan myth-fueled portrayal of the blondest Nexus 6 replicant this side of Hitler's wildest iron-fisted wet dream. And the perfect Juliet to Rutger's Batty has to be Daryl Pris Hanna in the most stunning Elsa Lancaster impression since Bride of Frankenstein. Phil Dick himself, as informal film consultant, almost had his way. 
But last-minute Victoria principal stand-in Sean Young more than makes up for the absence of Dick's number one pinup as she seizes the mystery that suffuses the pivotal role of Rachel and goes running with it in a killer set of thespian bittersweet. And whimsical William Sanderson chimes in with his most poignantly alienated chicken-faced portrayal of a Darwinian outsider since Raggedy Man. Reinforcing the other. The Terry Gilliam-esque unicorn interpolation in the so-called director's cut of Blade Runner is as artificially jarring as an android's dream. But the mythic trope is effective when kept minimal, and David Peoples' lean screenplay rewrite was praised by Phil for its improved impactfulness over his novel. Each reinforces the other. If you start out with a book, the screenplay adds material to that. If you start out with a screenplay, the book adds material. So they're beautifully symmetrical. Excised from the film are entire subplots. Phil's future religio opiate, Mercerism, a faith based on direct contact with deity Wilbur Mercer via empathy box. The crusty-like antics of TV comedian Buster Friendly. The double whammy of android lookalikes Rachel and Pris, and the crucial plot suspension where Deckard finds himself in a parallel police department run by androids and senses that he, and possibly everyone else, may be android. The dissolution of the human-android distinction may be common to both novel and screenplay, but only the film emphatically charges the plot with the android's ruthless Ponce de Leon-style quest for the recombinant DNA fountainhead of life extension. Luba Luft, Phil's fantasy booth opera star who burns oh so brightly across Electric Sheep's highly acidified pocketbook pages, has been filmically transferred in the screen treatment as Zora, interspecies bingler and exotic snake dancer, who steals the show in the first quarter of the film. Ladies and gentlemen, Kathy Lewis presents Miss Helene and the Snake. Watch her take the pleasures from the serpent, advance corrupted man. They tethered their camels to a nearby boulder. They were brothers from the al Samant clan, Muhammad and Khalifa Ali, out digging for fertilizer at the base of the Jabal al-Tarif cliff. And it was there, under a boulder, as they were digging the black earth, that they found a buried jar. Mohammed was very afraid at first to break open the sealed jar. A jinn might be inside. But then again, it could be gold. So he shattered it open with his mattock. From the broken jar, flakes like gold flew into the air, glistening against the Egyptian sun. But it wasn't gold. It was ancient dust of papyrus, and there begins a sordid tale that ends in rejuvenation. The Desert Brothers began by filling up the camel's saddlebags with the leather-bound tractates now known as the Nag Hammadi Library placing them on top of the rich earth to be used for fertilizer back home. It was 1945, a dark time just after the Axis ally war mania overwhelmed large chunks of Europe Africa and Asia with death, destruction, dust and ruins, and then jerked to a dramatic atomic wrap-up in the Pacific. Immediately afterward, a movement toward anxious uncertainty and urgent doubts about the future arose almost simultaneously in the mushroom hearts of every earthly citizen who had heard the news.
Amid the receding echoes of war, then it emerged. A revelation from the post-apocalyptic dust of world conflict. A revelation from the distant past that came into the hands, seemingly by accident, of an unsuspecting group of Egyptian farmers riding their camels in search of fertilizer. What they had found instead was a hidden cache, carefully sealed in protective jars of cryptic ancient manuscripts, a collection of lost books and forbidden texts, including the crucial forgotten history of the plasmate, a civilization-building bundle of knowledge that would provide a miraculously vital paradigm for navigating in our own information age. That which is above is that which is below. We are moving backward in time. The universe, in fact, is contracting into a unitary entity which is completing itself. After all these crucial spiritual texts had been kept hidden, then utterly forgotten for a thousand years at the base of a group of nondescript mountains near the Nile in Upper Egypt, the local farmer's innocent and fortuitous discovery of new keys to ancient wisdom was ironically destined to first burst upon the 1945 world in a wave of unlikely disguises. A vicious blood feud, episodes of unbridled human greed, reckless disregard of life and property, and cynical commercial exploitation that embroiled the newfound scriptures in a drama of near biblical proportions. But fortunately for the spiritual advancement of humankind, there also shone forth from these fragile artifacts the exquisite, time-sheltered, long unheard voices of humanity speaking in a higher key, tutoring all who care to listen in workable, schematized patterns of benevolence, inviting enhanced social solutions via intelligent transcendence for all, and thereby reintroducing at a crucial threshold in history ideas and possibilities that the 20th century and our own were much in need of. We hypostatize information into objects. Rearrangement of objects is change in the content of the information. The message has changed. We ourselves are a part of this language. Changes in us are changes in the content of the information. We ourselves are information rich. Information enters us, is processed, and is then projected outward once more, now in an altered form. Fantastically, it took nearly 40 years for these newly uncovered documents to finally be indiscriminately unbottled upon post-World War II cultural geniuses, outspoken suburban greengrocers, and prophets and poets of every stripe. In a sudden barrage of belated publicity that plunged the Gnostic path right down into the newly techno-urban, plugged-in streets of the late 1970s Middle East, and outward as far as the distant streets of Berkeley, California, where a well-known science fiction writer had been awaiting their message. Texts that contain voices of living information that had slumbered in the buried codices at Nag Hammadi for centuries. Voices from a divine spark now reawakened in seed form. Ancient voices of a plasmate living through us as information. The mustard seed will grow into a tree large enough for birds to roost. Another aspect of the planet-wide exposure for the long-concealed Nag Hammadi goddess voice codices, along with the Alexandrian mystery text from the same formative time, was soon given a solid cross-cultural boost from a fervent student and advocate of the mythic insights contained therein. Chicago-born Philip Kindred Dick, Promethean bringer of light into the techno-trashed pulp world of American science fiction, stood apart as its most ingenious, forward-looking, and postmodern author. 
Philip K. Dick was fortuitously emerging into his mass-market moment of recognition as a sci-fi master craftsman at a time of upheaval and existential uncertainty in the American zeitgeist. The fire that fueled Phil Dick's late 1970s obsessions was a mixture of time-slipping orthogonal memory retrieval schemes and worshipful adoration of what Dick saw as feminine embodiments of Aphrodite and wisdom-drenched Sophia in the person of such pop star icons as Linda Ronstadt and Olivia Newton-John. Another avatar of active living intelligence transmissions that Phil saw emerging in the tumultuously changing culture around him came from four unlikely lads from Liverpool. I am thinking back, sitting with my eyes shut. I am listening to Strawberry Fields. I get up. I open my eyes because the lyrics speak of going through life with eyes closed. I look toward the window. Lights blind me. My head suddenly aches. My eyes close and I see that strange strawberry ice cream pink. February 1974 was the longest and most winding month in Phil's rainwashed religio-mystic journey, a virtual reality mystery tour to hell and back, from damnation to redemption. And though the nights were cloudy, there was still a light that shone on Phil. God talked to me through a Beatles tune, a random assortment of trash blown by the wind, and there is God. Bits and pieces swept together to form a unity. A beam of pink light had been fired at Phil's head during the electronically slowed down second half of the Beatles' pre-pepper pop down the rabbit hole chart buster. Phil was instantly aware that some intervention, a breach in his reality continuum, had occurred. The immortal one is a plasmate because it is a form of energy it is living information. It replicates itself, not through information or in information, but as information. God, as a vast active living intelligence system, or Valis, had entered Phil and begun to heal him. His shoulder, which had been dislocated since August when he forcefully flung a seashell against the wall during a domestic squabble, was now growing limber and painless. An atmosphere of dread and panic that had hung over the Dick household since the death of his beloved cat, Pinky, following a series of prophetic dreams, was now lifting like a miasmic mist, rapidly evaporating in blinding sunlight. Aided by memories going back over 2,000 years, Phil began putting his house in order, finally emerging from a three-year slump. Living had been easy with eyes closed, but what pain and anguish had been wrought. Now bathed in the light of his newfound knowledge, Phil began unleashing an armada of anti-entropic decision-making. He fired his agent and his publisher, remargined his lucky royal, and instantaneously diagnosed a life-threatening birth defect in his son Christopher, the reality of which was confirmed by a physician, and corrective treatment saved the boy's life. Phil now began receiving purposefully detailed memos in languages unbeknownst to himself, like Greek, Hebrew, and Sanskrit, and he translated and transcribed them in his dialectic, or God against Satan, and God's final victory foretold, an exegesis. The head Apollo is about to return. Saint Sophia is going to be born again. The Buddha is in the park. Siddhartha sleeps, but is going to awaken. The time you have waited for has come. Pilgrim Dick looked upon the scripture-like texts he was generating not as newly minted concepts, but rather a remembering of things long forgotten, a platonic anamnesis that awakened him to the truth of the spirit through the reactivation of dormant centers of cognition already lurking in his own temporal woes. When Sophia cast a drop of light, it floated on the water. An androgynous man was begotten, one whom the Greeks call Hermaphrodites. But the Hebrews call his mother Eve of life, i.e. the instructor of life. 
Her son is the begotten one who is Lord. Afterward, the authorities called him the Beast in order to lead their molded bodies astray. Their interpretation of the Beast is the instructor. He was found to be wiser than all of them. Moreover, Eve is the first virgin, not having a husband. When she gave birth, she is the one who healed herself. On account of this, it is said concerning her that she said, I am the portion of my mother, and I am the mother. I am the woman, and I am the virgin. I am the pregnant one, I am the physician, I am the midwife. My husband is the one who begot me, and I am his mother. My husband is the one who begot me, and I am his mother, and I am his mother. Alexandria, Egypt in the second century current era, a cosmopolitan city seen through a smoking mirror, a crucible, both mortar and blast furnace, the go-to crossroad, port city and marketplace, transformed by fate to a psychopompic laboratory, where all heavens, all gods and goddesses, all visions, all sacred science equations are mixed, distilled, infused, and transfused amid a seething 24-7 seminar of culturally intermingling voices from the streets and subterranean religious retreats. Here it is that Basilides seeks tenure in a newly sprung metaphysical school of his own making, teaching and mentoring his multi-ethnic cross-section of Alexandrian knowledge seekers from year 117 to year 138, always emphasizing in every lecture or pop quiz the creative force of the transmigrant spark of pre-existence, which dwells within each individual soul. Then, tragedy strikes. Nearly all of Basilides' 24 books of commentaries on gospel texts, and one book purportedly to be a gospel of his own making, are burnt to ashes during the destruction of the Great Alexandrian Library. Fortunately, a good chunk of Basilides' advanced seminar on nothing is spared. This ultra-rare Basilidean epitome, the lone survivor from his initiate-only teachings and closely guarded classroom notations, has been popularized in latter days by such consciousness-raising sages as Bob Dylan, whose Gnostic hymn, too much of nothing, borrows liberally from its pages. And depth psychologist Carl Jung, master modernizer of all things Gnostic, even goes so far as attributing his own seven sermons to the dead to the authorship of Basilides himself, as if the ancient visionary were speaking directly through his modern Swiss counterpart. Like psychic trailblazers Dylan and Jung before him, Philip K. Dick finds in Basilides a voice of revelation that can, on a good night, help reconstitute the fragmented parts of his personality into greater wholeness and assist in making sense of his life-changing pink light revelations. After his fifth divorce in the late 1970s, Bachelor at Large Dick never fails to attend each and every one of the Thursday night group gatherings of young sci fi friends at Tim Powers' small nearby apartment. There, Powers, Ray Nelson, and Philip K. compare brandies, sample fine cigars, and endlessly discuss contemporary films and recording artists. The all night sessions usually conclude with what members describe as the exegesis update author Phil rapping intensely on his latest theory of everything or trying to explain his own pataphysical perplexities to his spellbound cohorts. At one Thursday evening meeting shortly before they begin, Phil suddenly announces to the astonishment of everyone present that he has personally reconciled the doctrines of Pythagoras with the light-bringing creed of Zoroastrianism. 
Unaware of any falling out between the two mystery traditions, his listeners are caught off guard and thrust into a philosophic reverie it will take them days to shake off. But still more startling are the events of the following Thursday, when Dick shows up for the festivities in a hyper-alert state, channeling the Gnostic sage Basilides in his own voice, as Jung had done before him, a mesmerizing performance that plunges the entire group through a dark crack in the cosmic egg and compels them to ruminate on the dichotomous yet interpenetrating fabric of both existence and non-existence as though their lives depended upon it. There was a time when there was nothing, but nothing was not anything. Simply and plainly, there was absolutely nothing When I say was, I do not mean that anything was, but I say it in order to signify what I want to show. I mean that there was absolutely nothing. What is called by a name is not absolutely ineffable. We may call it ineffable, but it is not ineffable. For the truly ineffable is not ineffable, but above every name which is named. Names are not sufficient for designating all the objects in the world. Because they are innumerable, names are inadequate. I do not undertake to find proper names for all. Instead, by understanding without speech, one must receive the properties of the thing's name. Homonyms have produced trouble and error for those who hear. Since then, there was nothing, no matter. No substance, no non-substance, nothing simple, nothing complex, nothing not understood, nothing not sense. No God, no angel, not anything that is named or perceived through sense, not any intelligible things, and not anything which can be defined more subtly than anything else. The non-existent God wished, without intelligence, without sense, without will, without choice, without passion, without desire, to make a universe. I say that he wished for the sake of saying something, but it was actually without wish, without intelligence, without sense, and I say universe in reference not to the one with breadth and divisibility which came into existence later and continued to exist, but to the seed of the universe. The seed of the universe had everything within it, just as the grain of mustard seed collecting everything in the smallest space contains it all together. Roots, stem, branches, innumerable leaves, seeds of the grains generated from the plant, and seeds of still other plants when they are scattered. Thus the non-existent God made a non-existent universe out of the non-existent, establishing and giving substance to one certain seed, which had within it the whole semination of the universe. It is like the egg of some variegated and many-colored bird, such as the peacock or some other bird, which is even more multiform and many-colored. An egg which, though one has within it many forms of multiform, many-colored, many-constituted substances. Thus, the non-existent seed, established by the non-existent God as a semination of the universe, was at the same time polymorphous and many-substance. Always looming over, and at times rising above, a plethora of voices in the Nag Hammadi codices, is the radiant energy of Lady Sophia, the all-seeing and transcendent goddess, whose wishes and manifestations are always most directly expressed, as the Gnostics insist, through our own serendipitous everyday personal encounters with wisdom, that can surprisingly come, it may be, from perusing an ordinary cereal box, or spring perhaps from a tree we walk beneath, or dawn as a sudden insight at a neighborhood stop sign. Drops of rain streaking a window may open a door within us, or collections of trash for curbside pickup may offer a glimpse of the architecture of infinity. For the paths to perfection are branching, uncountable, and born of ceaseless reflection, both in things mundane and far beyond the mortal plane. A dramatic early text called Thunder Perfect Mind, found in the Nag Hammadi Codex 6, section 213, brings us a vision of Sophia unchained, wandering in a world of darkness, a world in dire need of the divine spark she offers in a voice of absolute transcendence. Sophia's supreme logic is, of course, inexplicable, her being unfathomable, and her message is always one of paradox, 
simultaneity, and the reconciliation of opposites through Gnostic awareness of our earthly nature's false and deceptive construction. You are first, and you are last. You have no place, yet you are everywhere. You are the name of the sound, and the sound of the name. You are silence, and you are noise. You are calm, and you are chaotic. You are senseless, and you are wise. You are one, and you are many. You will be controlled, yet you are uncontrolled. I am sinless, and the root of sin derives from me. I am lost in outward appearance, an interior self-control exists within me. I am the hearing which is attainable to everyone, for many are the pleasant forms which exist in numerous sins and disgraceful passions and fleeting pleasures, which men embrace until they become sober and go up to their resting place. And they will find me there, and they will live, and they will not die again. In our journey through the myths and metaphors emerging from the ancient papyrus tractates found at Nag Hammadi, as well as related Alexandrian teachings secreted away from oppressors over many generations, missing pieces of our own alternative history are beginning to be filled in, and an alternative future is made possible. The Gnostics contend that the human spirit descends from the supreme pre-existent Godhead and as such is of ultimate value in this world. Self-knowledge is itself the knowledge of the universe. When the world seems perilous and disruptive and our situation uncertain and insecure, the Gnostics remind us to return to and trust primal experience. Theologies, philosophies, and metaphysical assumptions never equal direct personal experience. Gnostic Bishop Stephen Heller contends that these experiences lead us back to our roots and foundations, to the basic truths and facts of our more than merely rational and deeper than merely personal natures. Once these primordial images from our inner world, where opposites unite, and binaries synthesize, are embraced and given voice and consciousness, we may find a potential source for creative answers to our most pressing dilemmas. The transformative alternative reality that is our birthright, where the self is a uniting force for all of our scattered parts, is the missing alchemical ingredient in Western spirituality. It is the prima materia, the creative existential matrix out of which salvific life-enriching elements may purposefully re-emerge. As Dylan, Jung, Heller, and Phil Dick suggest, effectively rescuing the West by combining its gnosis with all the rest, thus preventing a tragic and totally unnecessary decline and fall.
I am Ubik. Before the universe was, I am. I made the suns. I made the worlds. I created the lives and the places they inhabit. I move them here. I put them there. They go as I say. They do as I tell them. I am the word and my name is never spoken. The name which no one knows. I am called Ubik. But that is not my name. I am, I shall always be. Avoid contact with mucous membranes.